Welcome to Bible study. We are in the book of Genesis, chapters 34 and 35. Let's pray and let's go. Lord, we thank you so much for opening up the Bible again for us. We pray that through the Holy Spirit, you will enlighten our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 34 brings a story almost out of nowhere. With all the challenges and the ups and downs that we've seen in the life of Jacob, you would not need this. But it is happening. The only daughter of Jacob and Rachel is abducted and raped. The story, of course, is part of a larger narrative. I want to remind you that this is the Jacob cycle. Jacob has to leave home. He runs to Bethel. That's where he has a revelation of God with angels involved. Then he runs to Haran or Haran. Then he lives for 20 years. And then he goes back from Haran. He wants to go back home. But on the way home, he has to face Laban. Laban, his father-in-law, that comes to get him. Once he passes that hurdle, he has to face his brother Esau. And interestingly, around here, he has again a theophany, or a manifestation of God, with angels. That's why... I point this out, that angels appear here and here. But angels appear here at Bethel. On his way back, angels appear before he ever reaches Bethel. And that's an interesting element here. Because you have the impression Jacob should be at Bethel earlier than he reaches that place. And then, of course, he finally gets back to Bethel. Bethel here, Bethel here. And from there, home. And he meets his father. Because here you have Isaac. Here you have Isaac again. Rebecca, the mother, is not there. But somebody is mentioned here, Rebecca's nurse. Have you heard about her? Her name is Deborah, which in Hebrew means bee, like in worker bee. So some people would even say, well, we don't know if Deborah is a name or it's her quality of worker bee in the house. But in any case, the fact that she is mentioned reminds us of Rebecca, because she was the nurse of Rebecca. All right, I would like us to look at something interesting in chapter 33. In chapter 33, Jacob passes the confrontation with Esau. They have uh, met, they have cried together, they have again separated. Esau is heading back home, Jacob is heading somewhere. But interestingly, in verse 17, 33 verse 17, it says that Jacob journeyed to Sukkoth, built himself a house there. 
and made boots for his livestock. If somebody is traveling back home and he stops somewhere way before he reaches home and builds a house there and shelters for his livestock, is he in a hurry? Not really. But he has an aging father. Interestingly, they never speak when Esau and Jacob meet. Jacob does not ask about his father, at least not in the text. Although his father is still alive. Normally you would think after 20 years, after you've left behind a father that was already aging and blind, and now you are heading back home, you've passed the confrontation with your f brother, so there's no danger there now, what would you do naturally? You would run. You would run home as fast as your household can take it. Mm -mm. He builds a house at Sukkot. Then the text says, verse 18, Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem. And what does he do there? Verse 19, And he bought a parcel of land where he had pitched his tent again. Is he in a hurry? Not really. He buys a piece of land and he pitches his tent there. It seems that he has all the time in the world. While his father is still alive, aging, you may never know whether he will still be alive when you reach home. But wait a moment. How did Deborah get to his household? Because at one point, Deborah appears, but when Jacob ran away, he ran away alone. He has not gotten home yet, but at one point, Deborah is in the household. Because in chapter 35, right after they uh, go to Bethel, Deborah dies and they do the funerals. Question is, how did Deborah get to them? Do you remember when Rebecca sent Jacob away to his family? He said, go now and I will send for you. Maybe at one point, Rebecca sent Deborah for Jacob. Because Deborah was from the same place where Jacob ran. Deborah was given to Rebecca at the time when Eliezer took her from home to get her as a wife for Isaac. So when Rebecca was taken from Haran, from the house of Bethuel and Laban, to marry Isaac. She was given her nurse to join her on that journey. We don't know the name of the nurse there. We suspect it was the same Deborah. Fact is, at one point, Deborah is in the household and they had not reached back yet. Or maybe somehow they communicated. Maybe Jacob did travel to his father and got the nurse of his mother to his family so she can help with raising the children. Because that's the role of a nurse in the house. Something else very interesting. In this section, Jacob and his family has to deal with pagans, with people of a different religion than theirs. Similarly, on this other side here, here somewhere, 
His father, Isaac, has to deal with pagans. When a pagan king takes Isaac's wife away, it's almost a rape, but it doesn't really happen. But the danger is there. Over here we have a rape. So I'm just pointing out some very interesting construction elements of the story. So look now at this sheet, and you have the chiasm of the idols there. Do you remember that when Laban came and searched the house of Jacob, he could not find the idols? But the idols were in the household. Who took the idols? Rachel took the idols from the house of his father Laban. And now when his father Laban was searching for them, she was sitting on them in the saddle. But the idols are still there, right? In the household of Jacob. So is Jacob a monotheist guy at this point? Or his family, do they worship one God? No, they are still polytheists. They worship more than one God. If you look at the second little chiasm there, the chiasm of the name change, that is when Jesus Christ himself, that stranger, that strong man, fights with Jacob, and when Jacob uh, seems to be strong enough to overcome, the stranger strikes the hip socket, and uh, you know the outcome of the battle. But Jacob's name is changed into Israel. Israel. El means God. Whatever Isra means, the name change implies that now Isra is of El. Isra belongs to El. But remember, in his house, we still have what? Idols. You got it. You understand the process here? He is moving somewhere. So then you would ask, okay, is there going to be a moment in the history of this guy and his family when they get rid of the idols? Sure, there will be a moment. And that's where we are heading. But on our way there, there is something very dramatic that is going to happen in his family. And now you can look at this chiastic structure here of the defilement. The defilement, that is chapter 34, is Dina being abducted and raped. And then his brothers, two of them, as a revenge, kill all the male in um, that city. But as you can see on one side and on the other of chapter 34, there are some interesting parallels. Before chapter 34, you have uh, Jacob's journey to Sukkoth and Shechem, and he builds an altar. Right after that, he journeys on to Bethel and builds an altar there. Then you also have God blessing Jacob and changing his name in the first wing of that chiasm. But interestingly, later on, God reiterates to Jacob the fact that his name is changed to Israel. You have two moments of the name change. I don't know if you've noticed that. Why? The answer is simple. It's a chiastic structure. That repetition of the same thing at a different time indicates strongly you have a chiastic structure there. Then you have, before that, prayer to God to remember Abraham's covenant. 
you have then God renewing the Abrahamic covenant with Jacob. You have the company of Jacob on one side and on the other. And you reach back to Esau. So this whole structure focusing on the Dina story starts with Esau and ends with Esau. It starts in chapter 32 when Esau comes to meet Jacob. And then in 36, Esau's genealogy is being presented. Why am I emphasizing this structure? To show that something really important is happening here in the family, in the household of Jacob. And now with all these complications in mind, let us go to chapter 34 and just get a few glimpses of the Dina story. The Dina story starts like this. Now Dina, that's verse 1 in 34. Now Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Is it good or bad? She went out. She's a teenager, probably. She goes out. We don't have details. We don't know if she went alone or if she went with somebody. Maybe she had already made a friend in the area. Not boyfriend, but somebody she was hanging out with. Just imagine, you have uh, now 11 brothers. Benjamin is not born yet. And you are the only girl. Of course, you can imagine that uh, Jacob's household may have had some servants, some other kids. But in her family, she's the only girl. Is it normal and natural to go and hang out with the daughters of the land? Of course, you would say. Very interestingly, the whole chapter focuses on the perpetrator, on Shechem doing something bad to Dina. The text never says Dina did something wrong. Nevertheless, the way it starts, emphasizing that she went out to see the daughters of the land, points us to a danger or a risk, she assumes. It's a risky endeavor. Because you have there what we can call in modern language culture, clash. You are coming from a certain background, the land of the place, have a totally different cultural, not to mention religious, background. But she goes out to see the daughters of the land. What happens is, Shechem, the son of Hamor, or Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her, and lay with her, and violated her. Some try to debate and explain away the concept of rape. I believe the last part of verse 2 here, that he violated her, clearly points towards something that cannot be consensual. Okay? But then there's something else in the story, verse 3. His soul was strongly attracted to Dina, the daughter of Jacob. So his soul was strongly attracted and he loved the young woman. So this guy is in love. Is Dina in love with him? Well, who cares? You know, where somebody allows himself to rape somebody, it seems that the focus here, and this is, this is not a God worshiper, a Yahweh worshiper, this is a pagan. The focus is on his desires. He was strongly attracted. He loved the woman and spoke kindly to the young woman after he had raped her. So his family gets to know about it and they come to Jacob telling him, we would like your daughter to be our son's wife and we can just intermarry and uh, get a life together. 
but Jacob's sons are outraged. Something like this should have not happened, they say. And now when the proposal comes for them to become in-laws, they mess with their minds. Verse 13, But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and uh, Hamor, his father, and spoke deceitfully. So they deceived them. Deceitfully because he had defiled Dina, their sister. And you probably know the story. What happens is they ask them to get circumcised. And they enter the deal. The text says they enter the deal because this guy, Shechem, was very well respected in that city. He was the heir of the throne of the city, but very well respected. So when they are still in the pain of circumcision, two of Jacob's sons, who are those? Simeon and Levi go out and kill them all. When Jacob hears, he's scared. And he says, what did you do to me? Now everybody in this area will try to eliminate me, me and my family. My question is this. Was what the two sons of Jacob did, was it justified? You think so? Was Jacob happy about it? No. Why wasn't he happy about it? Well, he was scared, you may say, because he was living in that area. Remember, he bought a land outside of the city. So he was settled down there. So it threatens their existence. Yes. But there's something more in it. When they kill these people circumcised, they kill people of their own kind now. If they had killed them before getting circumcised, they would have been pagans. But hey, at this point, they have changed their religion. Their allegiance to God is proven by circumcision. Because circumcision was a sign of belonging to God. That's how it started out with Abraham. And they enter into that covenantal relationship, the Abrahamic covenant. And that's when Jacob's sons kill them. So Jacob's being outraged is justified. He says, hey, this is, this is too much. Of course, his sons would argue, and that's the last verse in chapter 32, but they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? So that's their argument. So they had an argument too. But still, Jacob's fear and the argument is stronger they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. That's verse 30 in chapter 34. And that's when God comes to Jacob. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel. Do you remember that I said Bethel should have happened somewhere earlier? But this guy takes his time. He settled down where? He settled down at Sukkot first, then at Shechem. He was taking his time. Normally, because he promised here, he said, if you bring me back, I will do this and this and this. But he never reached Bethel. So God himself has to come to him and tell him what? Jacob, get up and go to where? To Bethel. 
That's the agreement we had. I am the God of Bethel. Go to Bethel. So God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. God wanted him to dwell there because Jacob says, this is the house of God. When he encounters God and the angels there in Bethel, he calls that place, the previous name was Luz or Luz, and he calls the name Bethel, the house of God. So God comes to him and says, hey, go back to Bethel. That's the house of God for you. And make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And uh, Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods. Oh, see the moment? I asked earlier, will there be a moment when they will get rid of of uh, the idols, yes, put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves and change your garments, then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. Verse 4 so they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. And I want to make an observation here. When Eliezer gave Rebekah gifts, jewelry, we did not shy away from seeing what was happening there. They were dealing with jewelry. I think we should not shy away seeing what is happening here. Here is a moment when they remove the jewelry because they want to go up to Bethel. And verse 3, you have it on your worksheet, is a center of a little chiasm. And the focus is, that they go where God is, do an altar, build an altar there to God, and uh, renew practically that relationship with the only God. The idols are gone. Jewelry is gone. We have uh, that question, is the jewelry removed because they were idols? That's possible. But what the text says is that Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree. I would like to know what that tree is, where it is. The text doesn't say they threw away. They hid them. Did they come back later and got them? I don't know. Fact is, we have a moment of repentance here. The whole household of Jacob is going up to Bethel to meet God. And they do this. They remove their jewels. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, verse 6, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, the God of the house of God. That's the translation. Because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. And here, Deborah appears. And they buried Deborah. And the place was called Terebinth of Weeping. They wept at the death of Deborah. Deborah was an important person in the household. Somebody that takes care of your children is an important person. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came to Padam Aram and blessed him. And again, verse 10 is a little focal point. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. 
also God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and your descendants after you I give this land. And again, he sets up a pillar and pours oil on it, just the way he did it when he first got to Bethel. But if you analyze the whole situation, it seems that this reiteration of the name change is the moment when finally Jacob and his family become monotheistic, meaning they worship one single God, Yahweh. All the way through the story, Yes, God was chasing Jacob or going ahead of Jacob. God was with him. God was taking care of him. God was bringing now him back. But polytheism is not something that is easy to just get rid of. It's a step-by-step -step process. But the beauty of the Jacob story is that Indeed, in the end, the whole atmosphere, the very uh, complicated realities of his life are cleared out, and he gets back to Bethel. Do problems stop after he gets back to Bethel? No, they, they start now. Reuben, his firstborn, sleeps with his concubine, with Bilha, trying to prove that he is indeed the firstborn. It's a power struggle. And you have Rachel giving birth for the last time, and uh, Ben-Oni is uh, born. Ben-Oni, which means what? Son of my sorrow, son of my trouble. And uh, Jacob says, no, 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 we cannot give that name to this little guy. We have to call him what? Benjamin, son of my right hand. Well, actually, in the Hebraic way of using that name, is son of my right hand in the sense of son of my wife that used to be my right hand. So Rachel is practically called by Jacob, my right hand. But the point is, the beloved wife dies in childbirth, and Benjamin is uh, left there an orphan of mother. And then the Joseph story starts. But at least one thing is beautiful in this ending part of the Jacob cycle. When Isaac dies, Isaac being the father, the guy that sent him away with his blessing, when Isaac dies, what happens? Esau and Jacob are together and bury him together. Somebody would say, well, because they had to split the costs. <laughs> no, no, no. I believe the focus there is that what happened on the way there, here, you know, when uh, the two of them met, was indeed genuine. But then, again, their ways part. One goes this way, one goes that way. Their families are too big to live together. And Jacob continues his trajectory toward the Messiah, because he's the genealogy element that leads to the Messiah. And Esau has a long and complicated genealogy in chapter 36. But that's it. Later on, he appears here and there, 
but not in a positive context. Adam becomes an enemy of Israel. Questions? So, in verse 11, 35, verse 11, God tells Jacob, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. And then you just turn the page, and you have Rachel giving birth for the last time. But the point is, after God promises his blessings, the beloved wife dies in childbirth, and Benjamin is uh, left there an orphan of mother. And then, you know, the Joseph story and how his brothers treat him. These brothers are rough, rough, rough guys. They can uh, act like savage wolves sometimes. And Jacob knows all these. And God knows that God works with them. We will see later on the story of Judah. Very intriguing story. How does God operate this way? Well, that's a very difficult question. But the reality is, God does not promise that if He blesses you, if He is going to be with you, you will have no trouble. Troubles of life will all be eliminated and uh, the attacks of the enemy will avoid you. Mm -mm. Life goes on with ups and downs, with good moments and bad moments. But what we know is that God is with Jacob and his family. And uh, indeed, that prophecy is fulfilled in the end because the prophecy of be fruitful and multiply, which reminds us of Adam and Eve at the beginning and Noah after the flood, be fruitful and multiply is a prophecy that is finally fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Because all this Abraham, Isaac, Jacob story, they're heading toward the Messiah. And it is in the Messiah, in Jesus Christ, that all those prophecies are fully completed. So we don't see that fulfilled from this point up to the end of the life of Jacob. Although Jacob will have a large family, but the completion of that prophecy comes later, and you are part of it. You are part of the be fruitful and multiply. The observation is that there is a difference between divine justice and human justice. From the standpoint of Jacob's sons, what Shechem did to their sister was something horrible, and it was something that should have never happened, and that's true. It should have never happened. And they wanted justice. They wanted revenge, justice in that sense. And they feel completely justified to the point where they can even deceive them and tell them, hey, do this, and then everything will be sorted out. And they swallow it. And then later on, when they are in the pain of their uh, circumcision, they go in and kill them all, and they feel justified. And the story ends with their words of justification when they say, should he treat our sister like a harlot? Should he? No, he shouldn't. Was it just? Well, humanly speaking, yeah. But then there's a divine element in it. Because these people, when they got circumcised, they practically, at least formally, 
because you cannot search their hearts and see who was uh, really in it and who was just formally adhering to something that had to be done because of the leader. But at least formally they pass from being pagans to being part of Abraham's descendants. And in that context, it is pretty hard to say that what they did was justified from divine perspective. Jacob, the patriarch, did not agree to it. And later on in the blessings he places on his sons, you can see that in some cases he curses them rather than bless them and reminds them of what they did there. So there are some very critical elements in the story that tell us, no, no, that should have not happened. Divine justice would have treated that situation somehow differently. Hard to say exactly how. But uh, what is amazing, in spite of all these uh, mis treatments and abuse and injustice, God still protects them. Because in the story, verse 5 in chapter 35, it says, And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Had not God placed his terror on those cities, what would have then happened to Jacob and his family? So again, God intervenes specifically for them to be rescued and not be destroyed. It seems that God is protecting that family, the tribe of Jacob, because that was part of the lineage of the Messiah. But I believe you can infer that there is something more than that, because God is interested in every single descendant of uh, Jacob individually as well, because out of that huge family, only one stem would continue the genealogy toward the Messiah, the one of Judah. And yet God protects the whole family. Because God could have said, okay, I'm going to sort out Judah somehow, protect him, and let the rest of them disappear. It's obvious that there is a battle going on between God's plans and uh, somebody else's master plan. Yeah. The question is, why is the God of the Old Testament so different, so different acting than the God of the New Testament manifested in Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ as a God incarnate, God in human body, he brings God to us to show us how God is, what he is like. Why is there this discrepancy between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God? My question would be, is there a discrepancy or that's how we perceive God? Is it a false perception we have or indeed there is a discrepancy? Let me give a New Testament story. In Acts chapter 5, there is a family that sells a property and um, they lie that they have brought the entire amount of money and gave it to the apostles for the use of the gospel. And uh, what does God do? Just forgive them and let them live happily ever after. No. God strikes down. Why? The text says that they lied to the Holy Spirit, whatever that entails. So that's a story when we clearly see in the New Testament God acting weirdly. Let me 
remind you of another story. At one point, Jesus is speaking to some people, and uh, he says something to the effect of, hey guys, do you think you are better than those on whom the building collapsed and they all perished? And the answer evidently was, no, we are not. Then why God allowed that to happen there and did not allow this to happen here? I mean, why would God protect some and not protect others? I have an answer that has to do with the bigger scheme of reality that takes in account the picture, I believe the biblical picture of the great controversy. The great controversy implies that there are two forces. One is God, and one is Satan, devil, whatever you want to call him. So there is a fight here, a battle, between God and Satan. But there is also a fight between the agencies of God and the agencies of Satan. And that can be human beings and non-human beings. Angels. Angels in the generic sense of extraterrestrial beings. Okay? So you have a fight between those two parties, good and evil. It seems from the Bible that there are some limitations of what God can do when it comes to people that are on the side of the enemy. Why? Because God has to take in account the will, will of human beings. If God takes in account the will of human beings, that by necessity implies that if these human beings pledge allegiance to the force of evil, there are moments when God, as much as He would like to intervene to save, to rescue those as well, He cannot intervene based on some pre-established relational dynamics between those individuals and their master, their Lord, because if these human beings say, I don't want to have anything to do with God, then God cannot do too much for them. I'm not saying God is totally limited, but there are some limitations there. In other words, when we say God is almighty or omnipotent, we do not refer to the fact that He has the muscle and he can do it because he has the muscle. Yes, he does have the muscle and he can do whatever he wants to do in theory. But ethically, because of love that takes in account human willpower, there are some limitations to what he can do. Now, coming back to the story of these people that pledged allegiance to God and they got circumcised, and they became Abraham's descendants, so to speak. The question is, because, because it seems that we have a radically different scenario, because now these people that were pagans, worshippers of a foreign god, they migrated to our god. Right? At least formally. The question is, do we know that that change of their allegiance was genuine or not? We do not know. Because a human being, out of interest, out of fear, out of who knows what kind of reasons, 
can do all kind of formal things, acting as if. So see, see the difference? We don't know. That's why I, my answer is, I don't know why God allowed. Fact is, God allows things to happen. God allows people to die in every war. We don't know, really, how God deals individually with those things. This is a very interesting thought. So you are suggesting that Jesus lived on the earth a short period of time, and he, during those years, especially the public ministry years, he tried to convey a certain picture of God, that God is love, and uh, if you take in account the Old Testament history, that is thousands of years, and realities there seem to be much more complicated and complex than something you can compact in three years and a half. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting uh, view of the picture, but I believe if, if we take everything in the New Testament seriously, then uh, there will be no real discrepancy between the New Testament and the Old Testament. What we will see, however, is a progressive kind of understanding who God is and how God works with human beings in history, which is a totally different kind of uh, reality. It's one thing to say there's a discrepancy. This is one God and this is a different kind of God. No. What I would say is there's a progression of understanding who God is coming from a very rough tribal and uh, warlike reality towards something more peaceful and more love-oriented than uh, it was in the past. We have to say amen. Lord, we thank you so much for uh, showing us that in the mess of reality, we still have your ways some of them very hard to comprehend, very hard to understand. It looks like it's just beyond our ability to understand. But Lord, we see that um, you are still in control. You were in charge of uh, Jacob's life, and you have all life in your hands. We thank you in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen.